Okay, so we're going to finish up section two, where we were just finishing up with the, the mechanism for the metal ion. And so we went through kind of the whole thing about carbonic anhydrous. Um, we did that in class. And so when we talk about metal ion catalysis, there's kind of two different ways that it can go. Either the metal ion is loosely bound, and so we call that a metal activated enzyme, or the metal ion is tightly bound, and we call that a metallo enzyme. And so it just kind of depends um, just how tightly that metal ion is, uh, what we call it. Okay, so all of the enzymes in our body can really be grouped into three different categories. And all of these are going to be the different kinds of reactions we have. So the first big group is our co-enzyme dependent redox reactions. So when we think redox reactions, I want you to think energy conversion, citrate cycle, um, electron transport chain, photosynthesis, all of those things. And they're going to include dehydrogenation, dehydrogenases. And remember when we talked about oxidation reduction, you know, taking away hydrogens, it's definitely going to be a redox reaction. So typically we have those electron carrier um, coenzymes that are required to make these reactions happen. And if you have noticed, the coenzymes that are required are kind of separated into two categories. One of them is the NAD plus, NADH, and then there's NADP plus and NADPH. Those are all going to be involved in carbon oxygen bonds. Whereas the FAD, FADH2, and the FMN, FMNH2, those are involved with carbon carbon bonds. So they each kind of have their unique set of uh, molecules that they can interact with. And so if you look kind of, this is just an example, and we looked at um, NADH already going to NAD plus and how we're losing um, a hydrogen there. And so that reaction, one example of where we use that reaction is in the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. And we're actually gonna do this in lab. We're gonna actually purify the enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase and watch it make this reaction happen. So it's gonna be really, really, really awesome. All right, uh, the second type of um, enzyme category that we have are metabolic transformation reactions. So these are ones where we basically change what we have. So the first example here on in A is isomerization. And remember when we talked about isomerization, we're just kind of rearranging the molecules. So if it's an isomerization, we have the same molecular formula. Uh, condensation, that's what we have in B. Um, remember kind of the, the general rule for condensation is that you're going to make water, but at the same time that you're making water, you're actually gonna add two substances together. Substances together. So what we have over here, um, if we kind of look, we have an inor two inorganic phosphate groups that are attached to a carbon chain. And so what we want to do is basically take another molecule that has a carbon chain and two inorganic phosphates, and we want to hook these two carbon chains together, the two things that I just circled. And so we have a transferase that's going to transfer um, one of the, the red actually, is gonna go right over here. So now we have the red carbon chain, the black carbon chain, and then two inorganic phosphates. And then the red inorganic phosphates are released um, together. And so we're combining two things when we do condensation. Dehydration is the opposite. Dehydration is a hydrolysis reaction. Um, and so when we undergo hydro hydrolysis, hydrolysis, right, we're gonna break water and we're going to break our substance into two new substances right so it would basically be the opposite going the opposite way right all right 
So then we have reversible covalent modifications. These are so, so, so important because they're, they're like on off switches, right? And so you're gonna attach or remove, could be either or, some kind of a molecular tag. And everything we've talked about so far has been um, phosphate groups. Um, there could be others, lots of others, but we kind of use phosphates because they're the most common used in the cell. And so kinases, right? Remember, add the phosphate, phosphatases, remove the phosphate group. And usually where do you get that phosphate group? And that is from ATP. And so one example of where we're going to do this is when we talk about insulin signaling. And so we have kind of some intermolecular molecules that act as signaling molecules to turn, um, turn insulin signaling off and on. And so we have this molecule called phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate, or the short way that you could say that is PIP2, because there are two phosphate groups attached to it, one here and one here. Um, so we just shorthand said PIP2. And so what happens in um, insulin signaling, if you want to turn insulin signaling off, you have to phosphorylate PIP2 with phosphoinositide 3-kinase. This kinase adds another phosphate group from ATP. And you can see here what was a hydroxyl now um, has a phosphoryl group on it. And so that phosphorylation event is a signal to the cell to turn insulin signaling on, but it is reversible. So if you need to turn insulin signaling off, you're going to go through a phosphatase and you're going to remove, you're going to go this way and you're going to remove that phosphate group with phosphatase uh, and tensin homolog, or we call it P10. But this allows us to switch between PIP2 and PIP3. So here we have one, two, three phosphate groups. That's why we call it PIP3. All right, so now we can talk about enzyme-mediated reactions. Um, so we talk about a reaction mechanism. A reaction mechanism really explains the chemistry behind all of our enzyme reactions. And so we know that all of our substrates are gonna bind to our enzyme active sites, but not really, really well. It's gonna be through weak non-covalent interactions. And that's gonna orient our amino acid functional groups so they're in close proximity to the substrate reactive centers, right? So we have the right areas of the substrate and the enzyme reacting together. And so then we're going to use these catalytic reaction mechanisms that follow the basic principles of organic chemistry, which we saw. So um, let's take a look at our first example of chemotrypsin. Chemotrypsin is a serine protease. So if it's a protease, it cuts, cuts up proteins but not proteins inside the cell. This actually cleaves the backbone of dietary proteins that we eat. And it involves both covalent and acid-base catalysis. And it uses this, um, call it the catalytic triad, these three amino acids um, to form a hydrogen bond network. It's kind of like the hydrogen bond network in, in water that's required for catalysis. So, you have to kind of remember a few things. We want um, we want to be able to change our amino acids so that they can perform whatever function they need to to catalyze the reaction. So sometimes you have to um, prep the enzyme. So what we're going to see here is we have three amino acids that are going to kind of work together, and so we have His fifty seven we have ASP-102. And so these two amino acids here, these are gonna be the ones that convert our serine-195 into a nucleophile. And the way that it does that is by removing a proton from serine-195. So if you look here, what we're doing here is removing a proton from serine-195, right? But how did we do that? Well, our ASP-102 had to pull off a protein from His-57. So what we can see is a not pull off to create a hydrogen bond with ASP-102. So now we can see that our hydrogen has been pulled off of serine-195. 
and our oxygen is carrying a negative charge. And so now serine 195 is now our catalytic amino acid. So this is our catalytic amino acid. This is the one that's gonna interact with the substrate, right? And create that new enzyme substrate intermediate. Okay, so this is actually a six step process that occurs in two phases. The first phase is where we're gonna make an enzyme substrate intermediate. And then the second phase is where we need to regenerate the enzyme. And remember we have in one mechanism, you can have multiple kinds of catalysis. And so we're gonna see both acid-base catalysis, general and specific, and we're gonna see covalent catalysis. So when you look at the very beginning of our reaction, what is our, our enzyme pocket look like? And so remember we said we had our catalytic triad of AS102, HIS57, and serine-195. That's our catalytic triad. And so you have to think about both the chemistry and the, the physical requirements. And so because chemotrypsin will only um, cut uh, proteins that have a big bulky um, R group. So in this case, we're looking at an R group that has a benzene ring, right? That it has to fit. And so you have to have this physical pocket for um, the right size R group to fit. So what you'll see is you have this, we call it the substrate specificity pocket. And then we have a second area, which we call the oxy anion hole. And you're going to see why that's important in just a second. Okay. So our polypeptide, because it's going to chew up protein, is going to enter into our enzyme active site. And here's our polypeptide substrate. This is what we want to chop up. And so what we're going to see is that our side chain with our big bulky group is going to fit into that substrate <clears throat> specificity pocket. And then once that happens, our HIS57, here's our HIS57 right here. This is going to remove a proton from our serine 195. So it pulls off that proton right there. And then this allows a nucleophilic attack from the serine 195 to the carbon in the carbonyl um, of the polypeptide. So, so we remember we want to break the peptide bonds. That's a whole way to break down a protein is to break the polypeptide bonds. And so we're going to have to find a way to do that. So now we have our first intermediate that happens here because HIS57 is going to donate that proton that it stole um, to our substrate. And so when we donate that proton to the substrate right here, there's our donation of our proton to the substrate. We're going to lose this peptide bond right there. That's going to get lost. And so when we do that, we're going to have carbon that's going to break its carbonyl. So we're only going to have a single bond there instead of a double bond. And so we need to have something to stabilize that negative charge on the oxygen. And so the hydrogens that come from the glycine um, 193, that's glycine 193 right there, and there's serine 195, um, those two hydrogens are going to participate in hydrogen bonding with that um, oxygen on the backbone of the, the polypeptide chain that we want to cut. And so we have a stabilization of that first tetrahedral intermediate. Okay. So then, uh, then water is going to enter our active site. So here's our blue water right here. So remember we said we're going to have specific and we're going to have general um, acid base. So our amino acids are acting as the general, the water is going to be our specific, right? So when water enters that active site, HIS57 is going to be a general base. And we know that things that are general bases are going to accept a proton. So it accepts our proton from water. So it picks up that proton right there. Then what you're going to have left is that hydroxyl. And that hydroxyl is going to act as your nucleophile. And it's going to attack the carbonyl of that intermediate. And then what we're going to see is that we're going to get a second tetrahedral intermediate. So this reaction pathway actually has two intermediates. And so the HIS57 is going to donate that proton to serine-195. So serine-195 is going to pick up that proton right there. 
and we're going to get cleavage of our intermediate. And so when we get cleavage of that intermediate, what we're going to see is we're going to kick out an amino acid terminal fragment, and then we're going to have our, our, our cut um, protein, and we'll be able to start to regenerate our catalytic triad. And so what we want to make sure is that at the end, right, that our functional catalytic triad is ready to go for the next round. So just go through the reaction mechanisms and, um, and see if you can look at them without the words and kind of explain what's happening in each of them. So when we look at different enzymes that are specific for, let's just say, proteins. So chemotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase all cleave proteins, but they don't all cleave the same kinds of proteins. So if you look at chemotrypsin, chemotrypsin um, binds as a huge, huge binding pocket and it accommodates aromatic residues. So things like tyrosine can fit inside of them. And, um, but if you look at trypsin, on the other hand, trypsin has a negatively charged asp group right here. So what we can do is we can have this, this ionic interaction between um, a positively charged amino acid that fits in the pocket. And then if you look at elastase, elastase has really big bulky R groups, right? Inside the protein itself. And so not much can get in there. It's too much packing in there. So only small residues can get in there like alanine. Um, and so each of the different enzymes has unique binding pockets and therefore allows for specificity in um, what substrates it interacts with. The next example we have is enolase. Enolase is a metalloenzyme. And this one, because it's a metalloenzyme, are metal ions required. And it actually functions as a dimer. And each of the monomers, so each of the different colors, right? So yellow is one monomer, green is another monomer, and together they make a dimer. So each monomer has an active site. And we have acid base, general acid base, and metal ion catalysis. And so when we talk about what, um, what enolase does is it's a glycolytic enzyme. And it's a glycolytic enzyme, so it participates in glycolysis, that converts to phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate so that we can then eventually convert phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate. And that's kind of the end of glycolysis, right? So if we look at our, our active site in enolase, what we can do is we can kind of look at the different amino acids and classify what they're kind of doing. So if we look at ARG and lice, so, so our blue ones over here, our blue ones, these act as general bases. So they're gonna be accepting um, protons, right? Then we have our negatively charged aspen glue, and these actually help with the binding of the magnesium ions. Remember magnesium ions are two plus, so we have to stabilize a lot of that positive charge or we're gonna have some, some big, big problems. Um, then we have HIS-159. HIS-159 makes hydrogen bonds with the phosphoryl group of the substrate, because remember we said our substrate is 2-phosphoglycerate, right? And 2-phosphoglycerate has that phosphate group on it. And we know that that, that phosphate group has quite a bit of negative charge. And so if we can, um, stabilize that negative charge through the metal ion and through the R groups, we're going to really stabilize that product. Then we have lice 396. 396 makes some ionic interactions um, with our substrate. And so what I want to do is I want to show you the mechanism for enolase. So when we look at this we know that our ions are gonna do multiple things, right? Our ions are gonna bind and orient that substrate. And so if we kind of zoom in, right? What we can see is that our substrate is in black and then our, um, our groups from the protein are in blue. That's how you can kind of tell which atoms belong to what. And so what we want is for our substrate to come in. Now our substrate is, um, to phosphoglycerate. So remember glycerol or glycerate, whichever you want to think about it, right? 
you have three carbon chain. And then what's attached to that three carbon chain? Well, we have one phosphate group, we have one hydroxyl, and then we have a carboxylate group. So that's why we call it three phosphoglycerate. Okay, so what do we need to stabilize? Well, we wanna stabilize this negative charge that's gonna happen here. And so that's why we have magnesium ions up here. So our magnesium ions sort of stabilize that, that substrate coming in a little bit. Then what we have um, is we're going to give up a hydrogen from our substrate and the lysine 345 is going to um, take that proton. Now, that metal ions actually make it easier for the substrate to give up that proton because it's stabilizing um, the negative charges up here. Because as soon as it pulls that hydrogen off, what you're gonna end up with is a double bond between these two carbons. These two carbons, you end up with a double bond. And so you have two negatively charged oxygens. This would not happen if you didn't have the magnesium ions there to stabilize um, the, the negative charges. And so it really makes it a whole lot easier for lysine to pick up that proton. All right. And so now that we have our intermediate, we have, we have these two negative charges that aren't very practical. And so we have our magnesium two plus ions that stabilize the charges on the intermediate to help it to um, reduce that required activation energy, right? Okay, so then our glue 221 is gonna act as that general acid. And so that general acid is gonna give up, let's see if I can do this, gonna give up a proton to our substrate. So we give up that proton to the substrate. And at the same time, um, what we're gonna do is we are going to lose water here. So we're gonna remove water. And then um, we're gonna, we're going to, here we go. So we're gonna remove, whoa. <laughs> we're gonna remove water right here is where we're gonna remove our water. And so here's our phosphoenol pyruvate. Now phosphoenol pyruvate is a pretty unstable substrate. And so it pretty rapidly gets converted again. Um, but because it's in the enzyme pocket, it's still, it's still relatively stabilized. Another example um, of different mechanisms that enzymes use um, are HMG-CoA reductase. And so in HMG-CoA reductase, this is an enzyme that is essential for cholesterol biosynthesis. And what we've found out is that we can directly inhibit um, this enzyme, if we give people a medicine, a drug, right? And we can reduce the serum levels of cholesterol, which is beautiful. So we can prevent cardiovascular disease, right? And so this enzyme in particular, HMG-CoA reductase contains four active sites for the substrate and a cofactor. And this cofactor is NADPH. So here's our cofactor right here. And this is going to result when we go from HMG-CoA to melavonate, we're going to have a four electron reduction. And so that's why we have the two here, because we can have a, per each NADPH molecule, we can have a two electron reduction, but because we have two of them, we're going to have a four, right? And so when we look at this, you can look at the mechanism and you can see the transition states and, but I think we've gone through enough mechanisms that I think we're just going to skip this mechanism, but you'll see all the same um, general acid things happening. You'll see all the same mechanisms, right? But what I want to go in and talk about more is the mechanisms of how um, enzyme catalysis actually happens. And so enzyme kinetics determine that. And so that's the next thing we're going to talk about.